We're going to be in the book of James. James chapter 1, verses 5 to 7. The title of this message is Wavering Faith. Wavering Faith. <clears throat> Starting in verse 5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives it to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Let us pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we praise and we thank you, Father, for your word. Giving us your instruction book on how to live our lives, Father. May we be obedient to living what you have given us, Lord. Speak to us today as we look at your word. Fill us with your spirit. Fill everyone with your spirit, Lord. That they may have an encounter with you, Lord. Fill me with your spirit that everything I share comes from you, Father God. We praise and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Faith. We're looking at wavering faith. Faith in itself. What is faith? Faith is the confident assurance that God will do what he says he will do, keeping his promises. That's what faith is. But we're going to look at wavering faith and faith today because, because we still battle the sin nature many times our faith does waver. But faith of course, is the essential aspect of the Christian life because it is the avenue, everyone, in which we are saved by God's grace and by the means of how we should live afterwards once we're saved, living by faith in Christ. When we believe and obey what the Lord says in his word, our faith grows stronger. But when we let our feelings and our circumstances override, <clears throat> of the life, our confidence in him and his promises, our faith begins to fail. See, when we start living by the circumstances and our feelings, our faith begins to fail. See, our past examples of wavering faith, we all know about the Israelites. God had demonstrated his faithfulness to the Israelites many miraculous times. We think of the time, of course, when he led the Israelites out of Egypt. And what happened? They came to the Red Sea and they panicked. And they lost their faith. And what did they say? You left us out here to die. But yet, God miraculously opened up that sea. sea. When they were in the wilderness and on the border of the promised land, their faith faltered. And here, because of their faltering faith, they were in the wilderness for some 40 years. After Moses sent the spies into Canaan, and they reported that the land was good, however, 10 of them discouraged the Israelites, saying they were not strong enough to take the land because there was giants in the land. So they panicked. Even though Caleb and Joshua encouraged the people to trust the Lord, with his promises that he would give them the land, their faith faltered. They wanted to go back to Egypt. Their faith had faltered. The present problem of wavering faith, as we look at verse 6 here, but let him ask in faith, but not doubting, for he who doubts is like the wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. And again, because we battle the sin nature, everyone, there will be times when our faith does falter. Because we're growing in our relationship with Christ. But the more we trust Him, the more our faith will go stronger. Faith is a gift from God that is built upon the foundation of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. For it to become strong and effective, we must develop it and exercise it. By focusing on the Lord and his provision and his promises, 
Because that's what faith is. It's the confidence assurance that God will do what he says he will do and that he will keep his promises. That is what faith is. Amen. And it's trusting in that. Otherwise, we'll be tossed about by our feelings and our circumstances or many times the opinions of others. When you listen to people many times, you'll get direction going all kinds of ways this one will say that, and this one will tell you this. That's why it's so important, first of all, to get your counsel from the Lord. Causes of wavering faith. Number one, when we're trusting the Lord, when trusting the Lord is in conflict with human reason. When trusting the Lord is in conflict with human reason. I talked about this many times. Living by faith requires relying on God rather than analytical ability because what seems logical to us may be contrary to his will. We can't look at our analytical ability or think we know what's best because many times when God's at work, as I shared many times, it doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense. His ways are not our ways. His ways are much higher than our ways. And we need to just trust Him. That's why we always say that, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And many of us know, and I've shared this many times, trust in the Lord with all your heart. You know that. Believe not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him. And He'll direct your path. But many times, we... We lie on our own understanding. We logically, we try to figure it out. We want to make sense of it, and then that gives us our peace, and that's not it. It's God's ways. And as we walk with him, he'll reveal it to us. Wavering faith happens, number two, when we allow our feelings, it's like I'm saying, to overcome our faith. The foundation of our faith it's God's word which remains constant, unchanging. That's called immutable. It doesn't change. Feelings and emotion fluctuate with circumstances. I feel like this is going to go wrong. Oh no, I'm just feeling this. But that's not necessarily truth. God's word is truth. And he says, I will take care of you. I will be with you. I will guide you. I will direct you. But do we really believe this? That is what faith is. Do we really honestly believe that? Or do we feel like the bottom's going to drop out and oh, it's going to be disastrous? That's the sinful nature goes that way many times. No matter how we feel at the moment, we can always rely on what the Lord has said because he is faithful. Amen. Praise God. Number three, faith wavers <coughs> when we fail to see God's work in our circumstances. We tend to perceive the Lord's hand working in our lives when our circumstances are good. But what about the difficult times, the problems and the suffering that come? We start to wonder, Lord, where are you? Why are you allowing this to happen? I don't need this. I can't deal with this. What's going on? Where are you at? Well, he's right there in the midst of it. He says he'll never leave you nor abandon you. But we start to wonder where he's at. Where, are you, where is he? He promises, like I just said, that he'll never leave us. Even when we don't understand what he's doing, we must remember that we live by faith and not by sight. That's the biggest, hardest thing, isn't it, everyone? To live by faith and not by sight. Because we look at all that's going on. And it looks, it looks by what we see, oh, this is terrible. But doesn't his word say all things work together for good? For those who love God and are called, that's his people that are saved. That he's going to work it out for good. Amen. He's working in every situation for our good and divine purposes by keeping our eye on God's word and his faithfulness. We can go back to the past hardships and see 
how he was there, and how he delivered us through our past. Go back, everyone. When you're going through difficult times, and how he walked you through those hard times. And he grew you up through those hard times. And that builds your strength, that builds your faith. Looking at things through his viewpoint, our faith grows stronger. Our faith grows stronger. And again, looking at our past situations and how he delivered us out and grew our faith through that. That's why many times it's good to even journal. Journal different struggles that we're going through. And as we trust God, write down how he delivered it through. So when we're having that times of doubt, we can even go back and say, Lord, you worked in this situation and you got me through. Now I know you're going to work in this situation. He's the same God. He hasn't changed. Situations change, but he hasn't changed. If he delivered you out of one, he'll deliver you out of the other one. Our faith wavers when we allow feelings to overcome our faith. The foundation of our faith is God's word, which remains constant and unchanging. As I just was reading that. Your faith wavers when you listen to negative counsel. That would be number four. When you listen to negative counsel. People are quick to give you their opinions, as I shared, regarding whether you, what you should do. But their advice may not align with God. Any counsel you receive should come from godly people. First, you should always seek God. Then, as you pray, God may put somebody on your heart to contact that will give you godly counsel. And always make sure that their advice aligns up with Scripture. Always make sure their advice lines up with Scripture. That's so important. Number five, our faith wavers when we focus on our circumstances rather than the Lord. This is always a struggle for us because we live in the midst of situ situations that challenge our faith. Instead of seeing them only from our perspective, we need to look at them in the light of God, who loves us through the difficult circumstances. <laughs> Our part and part of his will is to deliver us out of them and for us to seek his will and to know that he's working in the midst of our situation. To know that he's allowing that. This is interesting, everyone. He's allowing that circumstances to happen to strengthen your faith in the, for you to see him in the midst and how he will deliver you out. So your circumstances many times may not be good, but it's growing you up in your faith. Many times we don't look at it that way. We look at it, oh, I'm in a bad situation. What am I going to do now? But God's using that to grow me up, to grow you up. Strengthen your faith. It's in those hard times and in those struggles. Isn't it those times where we really want to seek the Lord? As I shared, when everything's going well, many times we're just going about everyday life and maybe we're not in our Bible. Maybe we miss some time praying with the Lord or, or reading. But yet it's in those trials. It's in those hard times. In those circumstances that we don't really like, that we start to read the word more. We start to pray more. We start to want more of him. Because we want to find out, Lord, what is going on? So he allows it for growth, for spiritual growth. He allows hard times. That's why James says. When you fall into various trials. Not if. I always share that. But when. Because we will. 
And there are the times of spiritual birth. <clears throat> Six are our faith wavers when we are ignorant of God's ways. The Bible is the only place to learn about God's ways. Therefore, if we're ignorant of Scripture, we will have trouble trusting the Lord because we won't understand why he doesn't give us our foolish desires that we want. If we're ignorant of his word, if we're not in the word, if we don't know his word, and we're just asking for things, why isn't he giving me what I want? Like I said, he works in and through us in the difficult times and hardships. But we need to know his word. We need to read his word. Do you know there's comfort in his word? When you read the word, there's a peace that comes to you. As the Bible says, that peace that passes on his hand. It's comforting. It's encouraging. Because we know that he's going to walk us through. And then we need to be excited of what he's going to do. Because we know it's going to be something for our benefit to help us. Our faith wavers when feelings of guilt of our past sins haunt us. Feelings of guilt of our past sins. We have wavering faith because we can't believe that God could possibly forgive me for what I have done in the past. Could He really? Forgive me for that? Absolutely. And this could be because we're still suffering the, the consequences of that situation. And we have to understand that Christ paid the payment for our sins. And if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from that unrighteousness. But many times guilt. You know, and the enemy will work on that. Leads up going to the next one. Our faith wavers when we listen to the lies of the devil. Satan is a liar, the accuser, who is always trying to put doubts in your mind about God's character and faithfulness to forgive you of your sins. And always to put doubt. And you're going to tell him about the word of God? Look what you did in the past. Look what you did here. But the Bible says that if we come to him and we confess him and we get right with him, he has forgiven us and we're cleansed. And we need to be about our father's business once we're cleansed and move on and move forward. Because there's people in dying and going to hell every day. And the enemy wants to keep us beaten down so that we don't go out there and do God's work. That's his main goal. Amen. To stop it. But he's a liar. There's no truth in him. Correction for wavering faith. Ask yourself these questions. Where are your thoughts coming from? So I just said, Satan's goal is to put doubts into your mind. When this happens, we should do go directly to the Word of God to strengthen our faith to walk with the Lord. Because the enemy wants to put those doubts in our mind. Ask these questions. Did not God promise to meet all of our needs? Absolutely. If we're walking with the Lord, he says, he will provide for us. Matthew 6.33, I share that one all the time. You should know. Trust in the Lord. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Walk with him, trust him, and he'll make sure you have all your needs. Ask these questions. Did not... Did God not give us the Holy Spirit in us to walk this Christian life? 
Yes. God's Holy Spirit is in us and will guide us and direct us. Didn't Jesus tell his disciples? I have to leave. And when I go away, I will bring the Holy Spirit to indwell in you. And that Holy Spirit will guide you, will instruct you, and will teach you all things. So we have the Holy Spirit. If you're here and you know Jesus Christ, you have to know Christ as your Savior to have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you. Ask yourself this question. Is there anything too hard for God? Is anything too hard? The answer is absolutely no. But that doesn't mean he will remove all pain from our lives because he knows exactly what difficult situations are needed to make us into the person he wants us to be. You ever look at it that way? He knows what trials, what hardships, what pain to put, to allow in our lives so that he can make us the person he wants us to be in him. Praise God. Amen. So others can see Jesus Christ in us. That's the goal. That's the walk. None of us want pain. None of us want sorrow. But look at the pain and suffering of Jesus Christ. <coughs> you see, to become more like him, we're going to have to go through these hard times. Become more like him. But remember, everyone, you know why I always say? It's temporary. Because one day, we'll leave this planet and step into his home that he has prepared. And he'll say, well done, my fine and faithful servant. You have endured. You have won the race. Like Paul said. You have finished well. Come into the place I prepared for you. Praise God. That's our hope, everyone. That's our faith. That's what keeps us going. Amen. Knowing that here is temporary. The suffering and the pain is temporary. But see, these are like, we don't look at it this way. This is learning ground. This is where we're learning to trust and we're building in our relationship with him to become more like him. <coughs> and many times we need the pain and the suffering. And of course, everyone, because we live in a, in a fallen world. The last one. Ask yourself this question. Is this one of the forks in the road in which my unbelief could cause me a lifetime of regret? Is this one of the forks in the road which my unbelief could cause me a lifetime of regret because I don't take this road because I'm afraid and I have unbelief that I will regret? There are many people have been called into service for God. But fear follows them and stops them. And they regret of not going forward doing what God has called them to do because of the fear and of their own belief. And it's very sad. Very sad. We have to understand that God wants to lead us, guide us, direct us in all that we do. The scriptures I have here keeps us on track. When everything else in our lives tempts us to distract us from the Lord, when we walk in faith and read scripture, we become linked to him and our faith will grow strong. Our faith will grow strong. Strong. As I close this message today, we prepare our hearts for communion. What situation causes your faith to waver? What circumstance? <coughs> what difficulties? Is it the hardships? Is it suffering? Is it sickness, illness? 
What causes your faith to waver? What causes you not to trust? What role do your emotions play in? Your emotions and your circumstances play in your wavering faith. Is it your faith wavers because of how you <coughs> feel? Many times, people don't, you know, we're all there, we'll come out to worship service. Because they don't feel, they're struggling. And I'm here to tell you, there are the times you need to come out. There are the times your brothers and sisters can lift you up. There are the times you need to be here. Well, if we go on our feelings, I don't feel like it. I just can't do it. That's coming from the pits of hell. Amen. It's not coming from God. Because here, in the household of the Lord, you're with brothers and sisters that can lift you up, can pray for you, can encourage you. And you'll go back out that door feeling a lot better than when you came in. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. As I close, we prepare our hearts for communion today. You may be here and you really don't have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what Christianity is. See, it's built on faith in a personal relationship. You'll hear me preach this every week. It's not religion. You don't get to heaven by religion. You get to heaven by a personal relationship in Jesus Christ. What he did on that cross, that he died and he rose on the third day and he lives at the right hand of the Father. And his spirit is going out to live in every believer who truly will accept him as Lord. Lord Yahweh. That's personal, personal relationship. That's true salvation. Asking him for forgiveness to come into your life. And at that point, you become a new creation in Christ. We're going to close here in prayer, and we're going to prepare for communion. But I am here to share with you. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, don't take to communion. It's only for those who truly have trusted Jesus as Lord and Savior. It's a symbolism of what he did for us. That he died on that cross. He saw it and said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And he shed his blood that you and I would have a home in his heaven one day. Thank you, Jesus. Let us pray and prepare for our communion. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Father, for your word today, Father. Father, may we not have wavering faith, but there are going to be times, Lord, because we're still growing in our walk with you, that our faith might waver. But help us, Lord, to rely on you and trust you no matter what. Lord, no matter what. For we live by faith and not by sight, Lord oh God. Father God, now I pray that you would prepare our hearts. That we would confess any sin in our lives, Lord. That we would get right with you as we prepare for communion. Let's have a moment of prayer as we prepare our hearts to take these elements symbolizing your death, your burial, and resurrection. In Christ's name, amen. We're going to take a moment in prayer.